Good morning from Austin, Texas. On behalf of the NMC, I'm delighted to welcome you to the official release of the NMC COSIN Horizon Report 2016 K-12 Edition and Toolkit. I'm your host today, Alex Freeman, Senior Director of Membership and Special Projects at the NMC. I am joined by Gordon Jackson, who's here to assist on technical support. Uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, so are we, and our hashtag for today's event is hashtag NMCHZ. We're also going to have some a, a few polls that we're going to ask uh, throughout the program, so make sure to give, give us your feedback. Uh, now on to the moderator of today's program, the NMC's own Senior Director of Publications and Communications, Samantha Becker. She is joined by Keith Kruger, CEO of COSIN, and uh, Joni Kay, School Technology Coordinator for Mountain Brook High School in Alabama, and John Farnham our sponsor for the report. So uh, take it away, Sam. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, it's a really big honor for um, to be releasing this report today. Um, a lot of love and research went into it. Um, and I just have to start out by uh, first, of course, thanking COSIN for being a tremendous partner. Um, I think this is uh, potentially, we started the K-12 report together in 2009, I want to say, um, and so many additions since, and um, it's been great charting um, emerging technologies in K-12 education over all these years. Um, and I also want to thank um, John Farnham with Share Fair Nation. Uh, Share Fair Nation has been an excellent sponsor um, in so many ways, but also because their mission is so deeply aligned. Um, with the content of the report and what we're doing. So we're just elated to have John and Share Fair Nation and the Mortgage Family Foundation on board. Um, and then of course, uh, Joni Kay is representing our expert panel. Um, some people may not know that um, it's actually not myself, Alex Gordon, or any of the NMC staff who selects the topics in each year's report. It's actually an international panel of experts who takes everything that they're experiencing in their daily lives in the trenches of K-12 education, um, and actually selects the topics they believe they're poised to disrupt um, teaching and learning. Um, and so Joni, so happy that you're here representing the panel. Um, Looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah, and before we get started and in diving into the contents of the report, um, I wanna just give every, all the panelists uh, just a chance to give a little bit of background on themselves and the work they're doing. Um, and so I'm gonna kick it over first to you, Keith. Thanks, uh, Sam. It's great to, to be here and to be part of another exciting uh, launch of the annual uh, K-12 uh, uh, Horizon Report. Back uh, uh, many years ago, I remember we were regular readers. I was a regular reader, many of my board members uh, uh, of the Higher Ed Report, and we reached out to NMC and said, you know, we think it's fabulous, but we also think that there are some unique aspects of K-12. And uh, let's partner together. And before I got the word out, we immediately got an affirmative from NMC and they've been, uh, or we've been with them ever since on this journey. And uh, I really appreciate the way that we collaborate and uh, hopefully uh, spark some conversation about what new and emerging technologies mean for learning. So this is great. And we're going to hear a little bit later about uh, an enhancement, I think, to the report, which is our toolkit. So we'll talk about that later. Excellent. Thank you, Keith. And over to you, John. Good morning from beautiful Colorado. Um, it, this is such a privilege for us to partner with COSIN and with uh, NMC on the Horizon Report. When, when Keith came to us at the Mortgage Family Foundation and Share Fair Nation and said, I've got this idea, what do you think about this? Um, we started looking at the tool itself and in the application and uptake of the content, and it became instantly clear that this was something that we had to get behind. It, at Share Fair Nation, our, our job is to empower educators to prepare students for um, success in the global society. And the way that we achieve that goal is by personalizing uh, professional learning for educators. So all the work we do is in pedagogy. And it, it, when you see this report, you are going to see uh, the DNA of Share Fair Nation all throughout this report. There is direct alignment with the work that we are doing with the professional development we're delivering and with the development of our online space and, and content. So I'm very, very excited to partner with COSIN and NMC. And I think um, uh, everybody on the 
the webinar is going to be very impressed with the work that has gone into this, this edition of the report. So thank you for having us, Samantha, and Keith, thanks for the introduction to NNC and the Horizon Report. Thank you so much, John. So happy to have you here, and thank you for your support. Um, last but not least, Joni, over to you. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to participate. This is an exciting opportunity. Working with the New Horizon Report is an amazing experience, and I have learned so much from all the people that were involved with it. So um, if you ever have that opportunity, I suggest you take it, because it is an amazing event. Thank you. That's a great plug, actually. So all of you in the audience who, you know, once we start sharing the findings of the report are thinking, hey, why didn't this topic make the report or why did this one make the report? Well, we want your voices heard um, and there is actually a way to serve on a future panel. And um, we can drop the link in the chat later, but it's go.nmc.org slash panel. Hopefully easy to remember. Uh, and we'd love to see you on the next, um, you know, K-12 edition panel or really any Horizon Project panel. All right, um, to the main event, I'm gonna share some slides with you right now. And we're gonna just do a, do a little bit of an overview of the content of the report um, and also get some um, good perspectives from Keith and Joni along the way about how they're seeing some of these findings materialize across um, school districts and, and organizations. All right, so um, just in case you're wondering, this is in fact uh, the release of the K-12 Report and Toolkit. It's not that under, uh, underwater basket weaving course, so sorry to disappoint those of you who are, who are there for that. Um, and for every edition, um, of course, as we mentioned, um, we have great partners and sponsors, but um, I also wanna point out that um, everything is published under a Creative Commons license. Um, so I love when the press release goes out and I get a flurry of emails saying, hey, can I share this? Can I print this? And the answer is an emphatic yes, please do. Um, this report is yours to um, you know, adapt, remix, share however you see fit. Um, we encourage broad dis uh, dissemination. And of course, big thanks to Share for a Nation. Um, their support is greatly appreciated. I really do hope uh, that everyone takes some time and, and visits their website after this to learn more about the great work that they're doing. Um, always got to plug the Twitter um, because we love to continue the conversations from the report year round. So if you feel like adding some thoughts into a back channel, um, you know, reach out to us at, at, at our handles and use hashtag NMCHZ. Let's keep the conversations going. So the Horizon Project, just a little bit of background before we dive in, is actually in its 15th year. Um, and as far as we know, that's the longest standing um, study into educational technology uptake across the globe. We have over 60 editions, well over 75 translations, and the report, um, thanks to um, people like our panelists today, seems to just grow and get better and stronger each year. Um, and uh, that's really exciting. Um, in fact, um, as we speak, um, reports, the report is being downloaded. Um, our entire series garners about 4 million downloads annually. Um, all over the world in nearly 200 countries. You can see um, the red dots really emphasize, um, you know, the global readership, which is really, really exciting because, um, you know, we get the really diverse perspectives of an international panel reflected in the report, but also reflected in the people who are putting the report and toolkit into action. For those of you who um, are longtime fans of the K-12 report, that's great. We're so happy to have you here. Uh, but might I suggest you may be interested in learning about some of our regional and sector reports, um, as well as reports that we do for higher ed, museums, and libraries. Um, and those are available um, on, on our website, of course, freely. Um, and as I kind of mentioned earlier, um, the topics that we're going to talk about today are all decided by an expert panel. Um, this screenshot here is just one tiny fraction of the conversations that take place um, in an asynchronous discourse over the period of about three months. Um, we take an online collaborative workspace or a wiki, if you will, um, and we seed it with prompts, um, with desktop research, um, and all kinds of really inspiration and fodder to get the panel um, you know, going and, and talking and sharing their experiences and their views on specific trends, challenges, and technology developments. Um, and after this conversation, this back and forth, um, we take all the topics and anything new proposed by the panel, and we place them into a voting system and ask um, people on the panel to actually 
narrow our huge list down um, and vote on you know the top trends, challenges, and tech developments. And then, um, if that wasn't enough, uh, later we decide that mm, let's cut this list in half. Let's whittle it down to a more manageable size, and uh, we do something called survivor-style voting. Um, which is exactly how it sounds. We ask panelists to actually kick topics off the island and vote on you know, what they think you know, isn't as important. Uh, and that's how we get the master list of topics that you see um, in, the, in the report. Um, so we're really gonna follow, if you have the report in front of you, kind of like the, the chronological order of the report. We're gonna dive into trends first and then take a walk on the dark side with challenges, um, get excited about ad tech together, and then we're gonna discuss um, all the exciting things that can be done around the digital toolkit. Uh, and I mentioned there's a lot of technologies that are left on the cutting room floor. Um, the, the most common question I get in, in presentations like this is, well, what about this technology? And um, just because something doesn't make the report doesn't mean it's not important. So I just wanted you to have the benefit of seeing some of the technologies that didn't make the report. Um, and this slide deck will be available um, after the presentation. So um, if I'm going too fast, you'll be able to check them out. So this is the report at a glance. Um, this graphic is also available in, in the report itself, but you kind of get a nice mountain view of what's impacting K-12 education. And um, what we do first with the Horizon report is we believe that educational technology is extremely important, but we also believe it's important to frame technology use in the context of trends that are grounded in reality. So what, what is the technology in service of advancing? What good pedagogies, what strategies, um, et cetera. So uh, we have this list of the six trends that our expert panel feels will be the most impactful in K-12 education over the next five plus years. Um, we have got long-term trends, mid-term trends, and short-term trends. And really what all that means is um, there's certain trends that the expert panel feels have been really important for some time and will continue to be important and impactful, you know, five years plus in, into the future. Uh, Midterm trends, those are at two to three years. And short-term trends at one to two years. Uh, and the thing to note about our short-term trends is um, every now and then we'll see a, a, tr a trend in there that's really more like a fad. Uh, it, it could be something that fizzles out quickly. Or with some of the short-term trends, uh, what we start to see is um, they just become so pervasive um, that, that and so commonplace that maybe after one to two years, we barely even talk about them because it's just common, you know, common practice, which is, which is great and really, you know, what we hope to see. Um, before I kick it over to, to Joni to share a little bit about how trends are materializing um, in, in her school district, just a quick poll um, that will be up momentarily. I'm just always, always looking to get feedback from you guys in terms of what is impacting you the most. So a poll should have just magically appeared on your screen. If you can just give some thought into what trend is currently impacting you most, um, that'll you know, give us some good insight um, into, into what you're working on. Um, I think what I'm most excited about this year um, is one of the new trends that was voted in by the panel, and that's coding as a literacy. Um, we're really starting to see this um, in, in the form of um, coding integrated into schooling almost the same way a foreign language would be. Um, at, a young, at a younger and younger age, um, equipping students with really important computer science skills to where they're developing basic websites, educational games, and even apps. And what it's really doing is igniting a spark in them around STEM education and computer science. Um, but also giving them um, make, and really important maker skills. Um, you know, when we talk about maker spaces a little later, it's not necessarily just about building something tangible like a product, but also um, you know, something like a website and you know, something that can be shared and useful to um, you know, larger society. Um, and so that's one of my personal favorites. But Joni, I'm really curious to hear how some of these trends are impacting you in Alabama. Well, actually, they all are, and we're actually loving every minute of it because there are challenges, and it's you know, it's just fun to work with everything. I think right now, coding um, as literacy, we've got coding in our elementary schools, and so we're trying to start and see how we can implement that. We've got what we call them programming, I guess, at the secondary level because they're you know, programming larger and larger products. We've gone one-to-one -one in our schools, so we're able to provide 
resources so the students can have more collaborative learning and, and deeper learning approaches, giving them the resources to use some of those tools. Redesigning learning spaces and rethinking how the school, the classroom works, it's really fun because we've got Wi-Fi everywhere on, in the classrooms, on campus, in the city. So it's expanding the learning space. So it's really fun to think about how that's changing the way our students are learn and making it more authentic. And actually the community is more involved because our students are out in the community getting to do projects. So all of them are great and we're just enjoying working with all of them at this point. That's so wonderful. I'm, I'm really excited about the Learning Spaces Challenge, too. Um, you know, over the years, I've read about really innovative schools doing things like, you know, launching a school in an, an abandoned paint factory where there's floor to ceiling windows and really no barriers between classrooms, um, which really allows for mo more interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary learning when there's no walls. And so I'm really excited to see um, what schools do to really reorganize the traditional school day. Of course, um, you know, for every, every positive trend, there's always going to be challenges that, that stand in the way. Uh, but that doesn't mean there's not something we can do about it, which is exciting. Um, that's why we categorize our challenges the way that we do. Um, unlike our trends and um, technology developments, um, it's not, necessar not, not necessarily about time, because it's really hard to predict how long it's going to take to solve a really thorny challenge. Um, it's really about scope of difficulty. So, um, you know, when the expert panelists are discussing the challenges, um, it's really all about how solvable are they or how wicked are they. Um, and wicked means that it is um, seemingly impossible to solve, let alone define. And so when we start getting into the wicked challenges, um, even the definitions are nebulous and uncertain. And we need help from people like you in K-12 education to put better definitions and terminology around these. Um, in fact, um, at a recent board meeting, I think um, a, a board member had a really good way of framing the whole project, which was, it's not necessarily, the Horizon Project isn't necessarily about providing all the answers, it's about helping people articulate better questions. Um, and so I'm hoping that just from looking at these challenges, um, you kind of start to formulate some, some good questions to bring to your next you know, strategy meetings. Um, quick moment for a poll here. Um, which of these challenges that you see here in the report um, are hitting you the hardest right now? I know certain ones may be solvable for some and wicked for others. And I think, you know, we, we have a lot to learn from each other. Um, um, that's one of the beautiful things about the report is um, in addition to the um, analysis and, and definitions, um, I love shining a light on positive examples. So you're going to see schools that are doing really innovative things to solve these challenges in the report so that if you're someone looking to solve a challenge in your district at your school, um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's potentially models and frameworks that you can adapt. And before I kick it over to Keith, because I know there's one burning challenge that Kosin and he have so much insight on, um, I, I have to call out, um, you know, personalizing learning um, is, is a wicked challenge. Um, that's something that the NMC has been doing a lot of work around recently, especially in our, our work with um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and, and the post-secondary network there, um, is how to better um, customize learning experiences to cater to individual needs. Um, and it's really wicked because while there's really great courseware and adaptive learning platforms and great tools out there, um, Personalized learning means a lot of different things to a lot of people, and, and that's apparent in just, you know, having a, a hallway conversation with someone at an educational conference. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, after the, you know, now that the report is out, people's views on and what it means to them and, and how it's materializing. Um, but a, a particularly difficult challenge that we're facing um, is all about advancing digital equity, and I'm pleased to say COSIN has done so much great work um, around that. So uh, Keith, tell us a little bit about that. Thanks, Sam. Uh, you know, COSIN's been around like NMC for uh, almost a quarter of a century. This is our 25th year. And we've been talking about the digital divide or uh, more optimistically, anytime, anywhere learning. Uh, the reality, though, has been that, uh, you know, I would say 99% of our time, energy and money has been about at school. Uh, but as we move into an era where digital learning happens anywhere, uh, we need to th think not only about at school, but we have to think about outside of school. And uh, the, the good news, this isn't on the 
significant challenges, but the significant progress is that at least in the United States, uh, there is a dedicated uh, funding source, the E-rate, uh, which has, uh, you know, gotten a 60% increase for at-school connectivity, and it's been focused on broadband and Wi-Fi. But as schools aggressively move into uh, digital learning, what happens to kids when they go outside of school or at, specifically at home? And that is a very difficult challenge. It's, it's not... Uh, a, a wicked problem because there are things that can be done and Kosin has uh, in the book in the uh, report you can read about some of the resources that we've made available frankly about uh, three quarters of school districts are not doing anything yet in the United States about this challenge uh, but what we've tried to focus on is in fact what are the 25% of school districts that are doing something about it. What, uh, what are they doing? And so uh, yesterday we did with the U.S. Department of Education and uh, one of our FCC commissioners a webinar that's free and archived that you can find on our uh, website. So if you want to learn more about that, you can, you can hear about it. So maybe I'll turn it back to you, Sam. Excellent. Yeah, really great resources. It's it's wonderful to see leadership um, around this around this challenge, and you know, and to really narrow that that homework gap um, is a, a really exciting prospect that I'm so happy that organizations like COSIN um, are working on. So after challenges, um, you know, then we really start to get into the technologies. Um, and for those of you that have been following the Horizon Project and the report for many years, um, you'll probably recognize that um, the technologies used to comprise um, the majority of the report. Um, it used to be all about the technology. You know, they were the stars of the show, and um, they're still extremely important as enablers and enhancers. Um, but I, you know, I think we, we believe it's important to set a precedent that. Um, technology that's not in service of promoting better teaching and learning practices. It's just a set of devices. Uh, and so, you know, when we start to think about um, some of these technologies that the expert panel um, deemed as so important and impactful, um, be thinking about those trends and the challenges in the back of your mind and, and how the tech can be used to solve the challenges and, and progress the positive trends. And so for this year's report, um, our expert panel identified six emerging technology developments that they believe are going to impact teaching, learning, and creative inquiry uh, across the globe. Um, so we have um, kind of similar categories to our trends, but a little different. Um, you know, the way that it's framed is, um, you know, when will the technology face um, widespread adoption? Um, and when we say widespread adoption, we're going by Jeffrey Moore's principle of 20%. So, um, for example, that would mean that our expert panel believes that makerspaces will be adopted by 20% of, in some form, will be adopted by 20% of schools across the globe. Uh, now, this doesn't necessarily mean that every school or 20% of schools are going to have their own makerspace, um, but certainly having maker activities or, you know, extracurricular programs where, you know, students get involved in local, you know, maker spaces in their communities. Um, you know, we're you know, starting to see that more and more. Um, and so here are, here are the six um, maker spaces, online learning, robotics, VR, artificial intelligence, and wearable technology. Um, I believe um, artificial intelligence and um, Virtual reality, you know, in terms of it being its own topic, are pretty new for this year's K-12 report and important to note. Um, and I understand, Joni, um, you have some thoughts on um, VR and makerspaces specifically, so I'd love to turn it over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, the, we like looking at the trends, and we're following the same one year, two year. We're kind of in that same place. We introduced makerspaces in our elementary schools in all different formats. And then our online learning, of course, a lot of school systems are using learning management systems from you know, just many different products to help our students have that experience. We've got, you know, Spheros and Project Ignite for Tinker Cars and all that. So I think we're the one to two years is going there. We do have um, the junior high has robotics and, the, you know, they do toll booths, they program robotic arms. Then our high school has, you know, they're programming into engineering classes and so forth. And then Working with our virtual reality, um, when we were talking about a while ago how to help some of our challenges, one of them was helping our teachers be innovative and giving them the space and the resources. So we put together an Institute for Innovation grant, 
and our teachers get to add things into their classrooms. And in addition, they added a room at the board for artificial and for I'm sorry for um, virtual reality. We introduced the Oculus glasses last year and got that ball rolling, and everyone got so excited about what is coming. You know, not necessarily that it's quite ready for each classroom yet, but what is coming our way in addition to the, all the other activities that are there. But our room allows us to work with you know, our superintendent and our board and vendors to bring in different products to test them and see how they're going to work, how we can incorporate them into the classroom, and how they're going to enhance education. So um, the four to five years is a lot of fun and needs a lot of um, work and research to find the best ways to help our students you know, just learn the different ways and things that they can work with. Absolutely. Um, that's, a, that's a really good point. Thank you so much, Joni. And uh, Keith, I know that you also have some thoughts on some of these technologies and we'd love to hear them. Yeah, and I, I think the interesting thing is that maker spaces over the last uh, last year it appeared for the first time in that space. And I was looking back over the last uh, four or five years of uh, Horizon K twelve reports, and um, you know, it, for many for several years we saw mobile learning and we saw cloud computing for for many of those. That doesn't mean that mobile or cloud went away, but I think uh, when we what we look at is at this moment from last year and this year, that concept of maker spaces, and you know, as we looked at earlier on the um, kind of uh, challenges, uh, uh, you know, making, um, uh, coding and uh, getting students engaged in their learning as significant uh, challenges that people were or problems that people were trying to solve this fits in well with that um, the interesting thing uh, online learning has never popped up before it's been going on for a long time I think it's interesting that it has reached a maturation that it's sort of here <laughs> and and then finally, I'll just say that you know the the uh, VR in the two to three years already we see so many uh, things both in the non uh, education space things like Pokemon Go and and uh, but also uh, so as those emerge more centrally, uh, I hope we do see more uh, kind of real solid educational applications of VR and robotics. So. Well said, Keith. I couldn't agree more. Just the ability for VR to, you know, generate simulations um, for people is really um, exciting. I remember um, I was at a, at a keynote at, a, at an ISTE conference one year listening to Soledad O'Brien speak about her program in New Orleans and how they're using really affordable, you know, technology, Google, Google Cardboard to show, um, you know, young girls, um, you know, to, to kind of give them a sense of like potential careers for them. And so there was one um, where they had a, a you know, as a VR um, kind of field trip where they got to experience like a, a day in the life of a vet technician. And um, the response was fantastic because, you know, here was a group, um, you know, of, of students from a really low income community who um, didn't know necessarily what was out there. They just didn't have that awareness. And, maybe in previously in their schooling, you know, they just weren't privy to those experiences. And so VR really does have that capability to transport learners elsewhere, you know, no matter where they are um, and teach them that they can, you know, dream big and, you know, and experience those things. Um, so I'm excited about VR too. Um, and, you know, for those of you who are playing along with Pokemon Go, um, you know, there, there might be a little Pidgey, a Pidgey moto over my, over my head right now. Make sure to make sure to grab that. Um, but another technology that I'm also really excited about that's brand new to this year's report is artificial intelligence. Um, sometimes the name alone just, just conjures a reaction, um, you know, especially the way that it's been portrayed in cinema for many years as, you know, as, you know, robots and, and AI potentially rendering humans obsolete. And I know that, you know, could, could strike a chord of fear in people, but um, what's really important to recognize about AI is even though it's in the four to five year horizon, um, it's actually inherent in so much of the work already happening in K-12 education. It's just kind of seamless. So for schools that are working, for example, with adaptive learning platforms, there's some form, you know, whether basic or more advanced of AI in there, um, you know, with, with algorithms and better understanding and, and learning to learn um, uh, as, you know, as students spend more time in, in the platform. Um, 
But AI is, is, is really exciting because, um, especially as we move, um, as Keith noted, as, as online learning becomes more and more pervasive, um, and you, you know, you think about schools that are, have adopted blended models or that, that are fully online. Uh, when you have a class um, that's all online and an instructor, uh, it may be really hard to recognize when students are struggling or, you know, you can't necessarily look at always at the faces of the class and see if there's confusion or excitement. And so the ability um, to have um, technology that could um, interpret and understand um, learner emotions and needs and respond accordingly and alert the teacher if it looks like, you know, there's maybe people not grasping the material um, um, is really exciting um, and definitely has a lot of implications for, you know, teachers to be able to, um, you know, rethink their roles or update their approaches um, in, you know, in near real time. So um, artificial intelligence, four to five years away now, um, really looking to see, looking forward to seeing how the needle moves um, in the next year or so. Um, and a year from now, um, when we're releasing the 2017 report, um, I do have a good feeling that we're going to see some, some, some progress there. So um, that's the contents of the report. Pretty exciting. You know, there's 18 topics. And of course, you know, we don't have time to cover them all. I realize it can be a little bit daunting, right? So how do we take all 18 topics, solve the challenges, put them all into practice, make it all happen? Um, it is, I know, a lot of work and involves a lot of strategy, strategy and planning. Um, that's why we're really thrilled to have a companion piece to the report, and that's um, the Horizon Report Digital Toolkit that Coast and Spearheads. Um, I think it's just fantastic, and this is absolutely the resource for practitioners, education leaders to use when implementing um, some of the technologies and strategies discussed here. Um, so strongly, strongly encourage you, um, you know, if you're thinking about how to put the Horizon Report into practice, this is how to do it. Um, and so I want to give Keith an opportunity to, to tell you a little bit more about it. Yeah, I, I love the, the Horizon Report. I'm thrilled that we put it out and it gets nearly a million uh, downloads uh, each year. But what we really want is not just to talk to the converted, but to talk to uh, educators, parents, community members, school board uh, leaders of what does learning really look like? And uh, while the, uh, you know, this group of experts, I think, have done a great job at framing the opportunities and challenges and new tools of today, the, it's in some ways uh, needs to be contextualized at your local school, at your local school district, in your community. And so um, we wanted to do this for the last several years, but have not uh, been able to do that. Uh, and so I really want to thank. Uh, the Mortgage Family Foundation and Share Fair Nation for stepping up and making this possible. It's a free new uh, companion toolkit. And uh, I think you're going to find it gives lots of ways to facilitate uh, activities, different kinds of meetings or uh, activities that you can do with at a PTA meeting, at a school board meeting. Uh, maybe you want to go before your uh, local chamber of commerce, uh, you know, and talk about what what should learning look like today? I think a lot of times there's a, a tendency by people who love technology to lead with the technology. And what we need to lead with is the learning. And so uh, this starts with the question of what do we want learning to look like? And then we go to the what the experts say in the Horizon Report. These are the the what we're trying, uh, at least uh, nationally and internationally, trying to solve. These are the big new challenges. These are the big new solutions. But let's focus the conversation on what are we trying to do today? Maybe maybe what what we need to focus on is a technology that other people see as out in the three to four year horizon. So, um, so th anyway, I'll, I'll stop there and turn it back to Sam, but uh, I really encourage you to download uh, both of the report and the toolkit. And we're really uh, interested in knowing how you use the toolkit. Uh, we're hoping that you don't see the 
report just as something you read once and set on a shelf or put in your inbox or your uh, file away, but that you start using it to really stimulate conversation. It's the, the, we don't want the horizon report to be like tablets that came down from heaven uh, and to tell you the answer, but rather used to spark the, the conversation in your community. Yeah, well said, Keith. Thank you so much. Um, make sure to download your copy. I'm really excited about it. Um, and we're going to turn it over to, we have some great audience questions, so we're going we're gonna to turn it over to answering those questions here in a second. But um, I just want to take a moment to say that um, we'd love to have everyone here today involved um, in the Horizon Project moving forward. Um, as I mentioned, there's a way to nominate yourself to serve on an expert panel. We'd love to have your voice in the mix. Um, but also there's oh, a web form that we have where you can submit a project. So as I mentioned, you know, we're always looking to shine light on, on positive things that schools are doing to solve challenges, progress trends, you know, use technology. And um, you may be, for example, looking at the redesigning learning spaces section and saying, hey, you know, my school has um, a really interesting concept for, for a classroom. Like, we should be in the report. Well, we'd love to feature you in the report. Um, and the first step is knowing about the project. So um, we set up a form for you to be able to submit projects year round. Um, so we'd love to hear from you. And then of course, um, good old fashioned email always works as well. Um, you can hit us up there at communications at nmc.org. Uh, and do make sure to check us out on social media. Um, surprise, surprise, the NMC being a tech um, focused organization. We love being on social media and we're constantly sharing the type of research and articles and papers that are mentioned in the Horizon um, report. So it's a really good way to kind of stay up to date on um, interesting readings and happenings um, in education. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're gonna uh, kind of take it over to the audience. I see some really good, really hearty questions in there. Um, so the first one um, is from um, Katrina Schwartz, um, and it's about, um, can you specifically talk about how the tech predictions in the reports speak to the long-term uh, trend of rethinking how schools work? How will these change how we do school and not just become add-ons? Um, well, that's a really well-worded question, by the way. You can tell that there's a writing prowess <laughs> in there, which I love. Um, and I'll just answer that briefly first before I kick, uh, kick it over to the rest of the panelists. But um, when thinking about technologies, um, and I think makerspaces is a good example here, um, I think makerspaces really exemplify how we could rethink how schools work because we're creating a space in school that's simply devoted to dreaming and doing, building, prototyping, iterating, um, you know, designing, 3D modeling, 3D printing, you know, and, and, you know, kind of like the creation-centric learning um, that really does, is part of fundamentally rethinking how schools work, moving away from rote learning, fact memorization, to um, spending the school day where students are doing something. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and this was for a challenge-based learning project that um, I've ever heard from a student, was a seventh grader who was, um, you know, using iPads and other technologies to connect with people in his community around helping um, the community recover from a, a, a natural disaster. And the student says, you know, with all this technology at my fingertips and you know, with this project, I'm realizing that I don't have to wait till I graduate to change the world. I can do that now. Um, so when we re are rethinking how schools work, um, I love kind of the spirit of that um, enthusiasm and that curiosity. Um, and, you know, I, it's my hope at least that um, schools encompass that more and more. Um, Keith, Joni, John, any, any thoughts on that question? I think Joni uh, has demonstrated an excellent um, example of how we can rethink our schools. And that is that we allow um, industry into our schools. And we allow outsiders to come in, help us shape what the content is that we're going to be delivering to students and the, the types of engagement that students are um, requiring to have the skills to, to be um, competitive in a global market. And so that is one way that, that uh, we can rethink how schools uh, operate and work. Absolutely. And I, I think we not only see the, the things that are in this report, but increasingly we see people thinking about the actual physical space of learning. And uh, that uh, 
I, I'm not sure if it comes through strongly in the report, but I, I see a lot of school districts rethinking, um, you know, what the shape of the classroom looks like. Is can you even tell where the front of the classroom is? Hopefully not, and uh, uh, the the fur, even furniture and things like that that are more physical than the technical. But uh, uh, you know, I, I, there's a lot of different ways to go with a, with a, with such a topic as redesigning learning and of course redesigning learning spaces and uh, uh, certainly the just the time that you know br instead of breaking down into 60 minute uh, uh, classes I see Joni nodding her head so maybe they've, they've done some work on that in uh, in Mountain Brook. Well I agree with everything and I think what the report does is give us some tools and rethinking it allows us to rethink school and our students are um like you said a global environment we want them prepared for that and it's no longer just sit in class for a certain amount of time no seat time has been um done away with in certain areas we want them to learn content but to think critically um problem solve give them the tools to do that uh, student-led learning it just opens up all those doors and of a mother of four with four distinct learning styles, um, I really love what I'm seeing. And I, I wish they were back in school a little bit because they're all grown, you know, by now. But I just, I think it's wonderful what we are seeing and where our students will be able to go with all these changes that we're trying to help them with. So I think it's a, the report is a great tool to open up some of those um, doors and issues, just opportunities for our students. Absolutely, Joni, really, really well said. Um, we got another question from the audience. Um, uh, the achieve, and this one's about the achievement gap. Um, it's a long-term challenge in the report and has been a huge challenge um, for the nation, really the world, for decades. So how specifically do you see the tech predi predictions addressing that challenge? Um, and how do we prevent the excitement about tech from widening that gap as it's already begun to do? Um, there's huge usage and opportunity gap right now. So it's a really good question. Thoughts? I think if you don't start your conversation about new technologies with the question of how to do it in an equitable way, um, th that it th that it won't. Uh, I think you have to start the conversation with equity <laughs> and how how to do that in an equitable way. And if even if you're starting it in a, a test bed, how are you going to scale it so that it's available to all? or to those that, that need it. And uh, I just think it's essential and, and we haven't always been good at that. We've been more willing to, uh, uh, and, and I think that that is at the heart of what we as a country, we at least in the United States need to be focused on and maybe everywhere in the world. And that is, you know, an equitable, uh, uh, educational opportunity and this just happens to be delivered digitally but it is no longer it's not any different than what we've been working on in the United States for the last 50 years uh, absolutely really well said Keith and I just want to um, and this this is a little bit of a shameless plug but also because I think this will be useful um, the NMC is currently producing a report about solving education's biggest challenges and for every challenge um, we really do look at the implications for access and equity um, and how um, and how the technologies and, and, and the way that you know in this case it's universities are structured catered better catered to first generation low income students and, and students from disadvantaged populations so that will be coming out at, in October Alex will be presenting it at WCET um, and um, you know and it's, it's a great question from from the audience and there's going to be um, a lot of discussion around that in that report so we look forward to sharing and i've got a, a weigh in on this one a little bit as well uh the equity piece is not only uh for students and access to technology and, and to digital resources it's also equity for um educators and making sure that students have equal access to high quality uh, instruction because their teacher has the skills necessary to deliver in this environment. So it's really an important piece that we don't talk about very often. And, and I think it's also about parents and guardians. Uh, you know, increasingly school districts, uh, schools don't send flyers back to, to parents. They expect that 
parents will go online to be uh, to find out about homework uh, and grades and other things. And we need to make sure that uh, they aren't left, that the most vulnerable, the most poor are not left behind. So while we talk a lot about the homework gap, that's too narrow uh, of what we're really talking about. We're talking about rethinking learning inside and outside, and that includes in making sure that parents and guardians and the public can be part of it. And I think we're going to have a big issue. Uh, we're going to see more and more. I know that COSIN is uh, looking at accessibility of uh, websites and content and how we make sure that everyone has equal access to those materials. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad that's becoming such a paramount focus. Um, so moving on for the sake of time to our next question from Sean McDonald. Um, from, he says, for many schools, the use of online learning is done as part of an overall blended learning, combining face-to-face -face and virtual learning. Uh, he's curious to hear if the panel has any thoughts on distinction of focusing on online learning in this year's report and where it should relate to blended learning. I'll just say, Shauna, I call out to Shauna, a former board member of ours, but, uh, uh, you know, I think it's a great question. And, and frankly, if I were personally reframing it, I would talk about blended learning because I think that that is really, we've been doing online uh, virtual uh, distance education for a long time. And I would uh, say increasingly the power of it is uh, that kind of blended approach to fitting in what's what can be virtual and what can what needs to be face to face so and what we've seen uh, as well is that that element of facilitation is absolutely required to achieve the learning outcomes that you're intending um, in an online environment and so doing um, online only without some element of facilitation and coaching is is we're, we're not going to get our achieve our goals I agree, and I think we're talking K-12. We're talking the students that need people to help them facilitate and learn and encourage and, and lead them where they're going. Um, I totally agree with blended. Um, I, I hadn't seen a fully online that works very often as much as a great blended environment with a facilitator that's excited about all the things that a student can learn and knows how to help them get to their, their individual um, needs and where they want to be. Yeah, and I will say too that um, one of the uh, developments considered for the report was the flipped classroom, um, which has been featured and I think the past was in the past several reports. It's, it's not in this one. I mean, it's, it's definitely mentioned and inherent in, in certain topics like online learning, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, flipped classroom started in K-12 um, and has really gained a lot of traction over the years um, because um, not necessarily, I mean, of course, because of how, you know, it enables, you know, students to do, you know, more at home, um, but really how it rearranges the traditional school day um, to where if students are able to watch video lectures and, and you know, participate in discussion forums, you know, um, at home, then when they show up to the classroom, there's more time to be spent on, on projects and, and doing and, and richer discussions. Um, and in that scenario, um, the teacher has a lot of leeway to be more of a guide, a facilitator, a coach, if you will, rather than the, you know, sage on the stage, um, which is an exciting development. Um, another question, and I think this will probably be the last one um, that we answer, unless there's any, any other burning questions. Um, um, J Kay Jones um, asks, how much, um, how, how significantly does the content of the report change over time? Uh, does the stuff in the five-year horizon make it into the one year in four years? That's a great question. In fact, um, we, we generally get people asking, oh, you know, is there any view that we can get of the, of the past few years to see how um, things have changed? Um, I, I know uh, Ruben Puntadora, uh, a board emeritus at the NMC and also, you know, longtime Horizon panelist has actually put something together like that. Um, and, you know, I think that would be a really good, um, you know, project to continue to do and take on. But um, I will say, um, that sometimes, you know, in, in, in kind of tracking the progress, sometimes we see topics, um, you know, that people get really excited about in a certain year, um, be featured heavily in a report, and then the next year they kind of fizzle. Uh, and we try to make mention of that. So I think a good example of that would be MOOCs or Massive Open Online Courses. Um, we still have online learning in the report, so online learning is important, but um, sometimes a, a topic just ends up being, um, you know, something that kind of has its moment in the sun for the year and then kind of, um, you know, um, 
plateaus a little bit. Um, and then other times what we notice is um, a technology or a topic may make the report disappear for several years and then come back stronger than ever. Um, a good example is 3D printing. Um, that was featured in the very first Horizon report in 2004 and then disappeared until about 2014, 15. Um, and the reason being is because suddenly 3D printing became a really affordable technology and there's companies like Autodesk giving away all the you know, CAD software and everything for free to, to schools in the US and Canada. And, and so, you know, there's a resurgence. So, um, and then other times, you know, there's technologies and topics that um, continue to gather steam and we'll kind of see them kind of gradually move from far term to near term. And that's really exciting. Um, but we do make a habit at the NMC of noting when a, um, a topic gets stuck. So a good example is game-based learning. Um, still one of my favorite topics because the ability, you know, for, for fun and, and, you know, and storytelling and the narrative to drive learning is exciting, but our panelists continuously were voting that topic into the midterm horizon, the two to three year horizon. And it was a bit stuck because um, it was being advanced by a lot of enthusiastic individual educators and definitely some companies, but there, maybe there just wasn't enough, um, you know, collective um, drive around it to, to you know, make it in the one year or less for, for widespread adoption. So that was a great question. Um, let's see, are there any other questions? Um, okay, so another great question that we got is, what major things would you like ad tech leaders in particular to take away from this report? Oh, what do you guys think? I think the report is a roadmap that we can and I, I love it because it lets us know where we are kind of with the short trends and then where we think we're going. And, the, and if you read the entire report, there's so much in there to let us know what's out there, what's going on, what's coming our way. And then the toolkit helps us know how to kind of navigate those waters because they're ever changing. So both of these are great resources and great tools and just continually to review them and read them and read the links and talk about them. I just think they're amazing tools if you're in, you know, education, trying to help our students and our educators. So um, I thank all of you for all the work you do with them. And I, I hope everybody just reads all of it. And, and I'll key off of what Joni's saying. I, I think, uh, you know, if you uh, follow uh, technology and education, you know, you can pick up lots of magazines or blogs or whatever, and it feels almost overwhelming. There's so many new things that are possible. The thing I like about the Horizon Report is it focuses uh, on what are the most important for now, for in the near term, and maybe a little farther out. Now, maybe some of those farther things out, out won't actually happen, uh, but it, they still give us the opportunity to kind of think creatively. And, uh, you know, it, and so I would challenge you not just to download the report, but to start a conversation in whatever way uh, is possible in your community. I agree. That's what we do um, at Share for Nation is we call, we call it feed the hungry. So become the expert on the content that is inside of the report and begin the, the dialogue and find your early adopters in your districts or in your schools to who want to experiment with this. That's how we're going to get adoption and implementation of, the, of all of the research uh, and findings of the report. Well said. Um, I, I completely agree with, with, with all of these points. Um, and I see that there's other questions and, you know, we definitely want to uh, want to answer them and maybe, you know, we can stay on the, the panelists and, and answer by text a little later. But um, just for the sake of time, um, we've got a couple minutes left. I'd love to give um, everyone the opportunity, all the panelists to go around and give any, any closing thoughts you have on the reporting toolkit. So Joni, back over to you first. I want to thank you for the opportunity. It was a great experience being on the New Horizon Report and working with everybody. I mean, it's really amazing. So I hope anybody who's interested will take that. And it, those are exciting times. And like I said, what, are, what is available to our students and our teachers is amazing. So we've just got to navigate the waters and help everybody get there with the best tools and resources. And we're all in this together to try to give the best we can. So. Um, I just really think it's a, they're both very important tools for everybody. Thank you. And I just want to thank again, you know, we couldn't make this report uh, 
free and possible uh, and the two new toolkit without the support of uh, Share Fair Nation and the grant from uh, the Mortgage Foundation. So that is uh, terrifically helpful. And I ho am hopeful that we, ha we see as much uptake in the toolkit as we do in the report. Absolutely. And for me, I want to thank Joni, Keith, and Sam and your teams for, for this wonderful report. You have reached your finish line. And for everybody listening, this is your starting line. Today, take that report and make, make it actionable. Do something with the research, do something with the time and, and resources that have been invested to create this report. And a year from now, uh, hopefully we will have a fresh starting line and we will have achieved some of the, the uh, outcomes that we wished from this uh, report. John, I love that metaphor. I'm gonna steal it because that is so true. That is so true. Um, and what I love sometimes, you know, stepping back after a report is released, like you start to hear these conversations where, where some people will vehemently disagree with something that's in the report. Um, and you start to see, you know, people have these, these great debates and whether you agree or disagree, that's great. You know, we need diverse perspectives. We need disagreement. We need discourse. So um, please, please let this kind of be the fuel to the fire to, to keep the conversations going and to, you know, really rethink, you know, what school can be and how to better equip learners with 21st century skills. Um, and that's the most exciting thing about, um, you know, this, this entire project and process. Um, so thank you all panelists. This has been just wonderful. Keith and everyone at COSIN, John and everyone at Fair Share Nation, the Mortgage Family Foundation, we're so thankful. Joni, um, so excited about what your school uh, district is doing. Um, really are kind of like a beacon of what districts you know, can be. So it's, it's been great to have, have you here and learn from you. Um, thank you, you know, to the audience. You guys are the ones that are gonna actually put this all into action. Um, so we can't hate, wait to hear from you year round. Let's keep these conversations going. Um, and back over to our um, one and only host, Alex Freeman, um, to close it out. Thanks, Sam. Uh, to wrap up today's program, I want to thank uh, Samantha, Keith, Joni, and John on behalf of the NMC for taking time to join today's uh, Horizon Report and Toolkit discussion. Once again, be sure to download your free copy at this link provided in the chat window. Uh, participants, if you want uh, more information about anything you saw or heard today, let us know by contacting me directly at alex at nmc.org. To learn more about future NMC online programs and get involved in our community, please visit our website at nmc.org, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter at nmc.org. Uh, with that, I want to uh, thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>